This is Yuba City, the location in which the five men came from that were affectionately known by their loved ones as the boys. Of the boys, each of them bore unique mental challenges and they formed a tight-knit group together through their association with the Gateway Projects, an organization which aids individuals who possess special educational needs and other mental health problems. Gary Matthias was 25 years old and came from Olivehurst. He lived with his parents and was employed by his grandfather, working in the family gardening business. Gary was somewhat unlike the others that we'll discuss, as he didn't specifically have learning disabilities. Previously, Gary had served in the US Army for five years, but would come to be discharged for psychiatric reasons. Gary had been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and there were incidents of aggressive outbursts and substance abuse during his tenure. Gary's life wasn't exactly smooth sailing either after his dismissal. He had a number of negative encounters with the law and did end up with a criminal record. He tried to turn things around and attend school, but he just couldn't keep up and it spiraled. It seems that he didn't see eye to eye with his stepfather, perhaps having troubled relations with him early on. But either way, he left home and ended up at his grandmother's house in Oregon. It's not really clear how long he stayed there, but he did come back to his parents in Yuba City, though he'd somehow managed to hitchhike the entire 530 miles, often stealing from people's homes along the way to stay alive. Jack Hewitt, on the other hand, in contrast to Gary, was the most vulnerable member of the group. Jack was 24 years old and from Marysville. He suffered from quite severe learning disabilities, as well as being known for his shyness and being a recluse. He didn't often leave his home, or at least not for very long, and didn't tend to stray too far away. Jack had a major speech impediment, and because of this, he didn't really speak all that much, opting to remain quiet most of the time. He also didn't possess the ability to read or write. Because of the difficulties that Jack had in life, his family stated that he was easily led. Though he was doing well in his place of work at the Gateway Projects, where he met the other members of his friend group. Outside of working at the Gateway Projects, Jack otherwise struggled to hold a job and his mother stated that he very much struggled with a low IQ and all of the problems that are associated with that. Given the right environment though, he could do well. One example of this was the fact that he helped his grandfather on his farm and enjoyed riding his dirt bike around the property. So it certainly seems that with the right support, Jack could learn new skills and function well. Everyone knew him as a kind person that was easy to make friends with if you could just get him to open up a little bit. Jack Madruga, 30, was one of the more independent members of the group. Despite being described as slow, Jack was able to hold a job and he managed his own finances. He'd served in the army for two years as a truck driver and was honorably discharged in 1968. After this, he became a dishwasher at a local restaurant while both of the Jacks had their own problems, it seems that Madruga had more street smarts and was able to make better judgments. He also had a car that he cared deeply about, a 69 Mercury Montego, that no one else was allowed to drive, except for himself of course. Theodore Wire, known mostly as Ted, was the fourth member of the group and Jack Hewitt's best friend. Ted was 32 years old and the pair had known each other the longest and were said to have been glued at the hip for eight years. Ted was also particularly vulnerable like his best friend, but not to as much of a degree, and he did have the ability to read and write. Despite his own issues, Ted would look out for Jack and was quite protective with him. Ted worked at a local grocery store and would bag up for people. He was perfectly capable of holding a job without the kind of extensive supervision that Jack required. Ted's decision-making skills, and what we might refer to as common sense, while generally being better than that of Jack's, still had a lot of room for improvement. For example, he didn't have a driving license, but could unofficially drive a little bit. He just couldn't fully come to terms with the rules of the road. He just couldn't grasp the concept of stop signs, for example, which would frustrate his family by ignoring them. Another, perhaps more serious example of this, would be the fact that he once awoke to his ceiling on fire. Instead of doing something about it, or leaving, or alerting anyone, he just rolled over and tried to go back to sleep. His reasoning? Well, if he got up there and then, he would be too tired for work in the morning. 
Things like that often sound quite unbelievable to people, but I actually have a background in working with young people with special educational needs and other mental health issues, and I can completely believe his reasoning. The final member of the group, Jack Madruga's best friend, was 29-year-old William Sterling, usually referred to as Bill. Bill was a deeply religious man. His needs were somewhat different too. He wasn't diagnosed with any special needs that I can see, but he was always hyperactive and could end up placing himself and others in dangerous situations if not supervised. His parents said that he was quite vulnerable and it would have been quite easy for others to have taken advantage of him. He was able to graduate high school though and was generally considered more intelligent than the others in the group, perhaps with the exception of Gary, at least according to one of the coaches at the Gateway Projects. Though the same coach also described him as lazy and that he believed the problem was that Bill just didn't apply himself. Bill was a very friendly guy though and cared deeply about others, especially those perhaps who weren't doing so well in life. On the weekends, he would take the time to visit the sick and elderly in hospitals where he would spend time talking and reading to them. We've already mentioned Gary, but he had quite a unique role within the group that's worth highlighting. Gary actually entered this friend group later than everyone else, but he became very protective of the others and could probably be viewed as the unofficial leader of the group. He would make sure things were properly organized when they'd go out together, whether this was just a get together at one of their homes or whether it was bowling or watching sports. His parents described him as the fifth wheel of the group as he didn't quite fit in as his needs were perhaps different from the others in terms of the fact that he didn't really suffer intellectually it does seem that his outbursts, as described from his military tenure, hadn't gone away either, as the coach at the Gateway Project stated that he had the ability to flip out, but he believed it was a result of the medication. The coach we've mentioned was actually quite important to the boys, as they were a part of the Gateway Gators, a basketball team that the Gateway Projects had put together. They had a game booked in for the 25th of February 1978, and this game was being hosted by the Special Olympics. The prize was an all-expenses paid trip to LA for the weekend. The boys were very excited for this and desperately wanted to win the prize. So, on the prior evening of the 24th, they wanted to get hyped up a bit and had decided to go watch a game at Chico State University, just shy of 50 miles north of Yuba City. This game began at 8pm and because that was quite late, each of them had pre-prepared their basketball kits and had them nicely set out in their rooms at home to quickly jump into in the morning. They'd promised their parents that they wouldn't be out too late after the game was over at around 9.50pm and would go straight to bed. As you might imagine, Jack Madruga was the designated driver and he went ahead and picked up the boys one by one. At 6pm, Jack had picked up Bill and was then seen at a nearby gas station by Bill's mother. By 6.45, all members of the group were loaded and they set out on their hour-long drive to reach Chico. At 8pm, they were spotted at the game and later witnesses said that there was nothing out of the ordinary happening. They seemed like they were happy, having a good time and chatty with one another. Little did the witnesses, the boys, the parents or anyone else for that matter know that this would be one of the final times that the boys would ever be seen. Once the game came to an end, just shy of 10pm, they got back in the car and drove to Bears Market on East 8th and Pine. Mary Davis was the store clerk and she was about to shut up shop for the night but was interrupted by the boys right as she was closing. Being a kind and friendly person, Mary was happy to serve them before she finished closing and there they bought a ton of junk food before leaving. When later questioned by law enforcement, she had similar things to say as those at the basketball game. They were in good spirits, excited and just chatting happily together. The boys never made it home that night which alarmed all of the parents in the morning when their basketball kits were still out in their bedrooms that had not been used that night. The parents called one another, hoping that they all just slept over at one of their homes, but this was not the case. Everyone involved was in a mad panic as they realized that this group of incredibly vulnerable people were missing. Police were notified, but I get the sense that they didn't take it too seriously to begin with, stating that they're probably just out having fun but the parents knew that wasn't the case. Moving back to the evening of the 24th again, at around 5.30pm, a 55-year-old man by the name of Joe Schoens was in Berry Creek, around 25 miles east of Chico in the mountains. 
He was driving up there to check on his vacation home that he was going to be staying at over the weekend, the 25th and the 26th with his family. They had also planned to travel further up the mountain and he wanted to make sure that the path was clear and the snow wouldn't pose a danger to his family the following day. As he was driving up there, at around 4,400 feet in elevation, his car became stuck in the snow at about 6pm. He got out of the car for about 30 minutes, tried to dig out the snow and push his car out. But ultimately, this didn't get him very far and he just couldn't get it out. This brought on another problem though. This attempt caused him searing chest pains and he believed that he was having a heart attack miles away from help. He quickly got back in the car and sat down, desperately trying to stay calm and to get a hold of the situation. He became very ill though and was vomiting and defecating. He turned the engine on to try to warm up and also turned his headlights on. Eventually, Joe calmed down but this episode left his body exhausted and he fell asleep inside the car. At 11pm, he heard what he said was an unusual whistling sound. He didn't quite know what it was but it woke him up abruptly and he wondered if someone was calling for their dog or something like that. But then, he remembered where he was and what time it was and he didn't really understand what was happening. Moments after hearing this sound, he described seeing two sets of lights which he believed belonged to two separate vehicles. Joe didn't have a great view of the outside as his windows were all fogged over and frozen but he believed that there were people nearby. He thought he could see silhouettes on the mountain. He tried to flag them down by honking the horn and rolling down the window to verbally call out for help. Joe received no response at all and believed that these silhouettes were walking away in the opposite direction to the car. Joe exited his car and shouted after them, but still no one was responding. This was a very bizarre situation and Joe didn't really know what to do, but he walked towards the lights and was in an elevated position as whoever was present had gone downhill slightly. He could see that there was a car and a red pickup truck parked next to each other shining their lights. He could see silhouettes of people moving around and he thought that there was a woman present holding a baby. Again, he called out to them but they ignored him and then promptly left the area. Joe didn't know what to make of this. He didn't know why he was being ignored or if they could even hear him or what. He didn't know why a woman and a baby would be up there of all places at such a time. But Joe was somewhat preoccupied with not dying and couldn't put much thought into it. He knew well that he was running out of time as the car was only going to last for so long before he froze. So he decided to have one more rest in the car and then he was going to make the 8 mile hike back down the mountain to the vacation home. While sitting inside the car for an hour, he then reported seeing flashlights emanating from a tree line just bobbing back and forth. Joe tried one more time to get the attention of whoever was shining the lights, but once more there was no acknowledgement. Joe then rested and slept until 4am, which is when he set off. He'd only been walking for a short amount of time when he passed by a car. It was none other than Jack's 1969 Mercury Montego. Nobody was inside and Joe thought this must have belonged to the group who had previously ignored him. He did have a brief look inside the car and said that there were items and empty wrappers all over the seats. Because of his condition, at 10am he finally managed to reach the vacation lodge where he was able to flag down some help. There he was given some aspirin and then a couple were kind enough to drive him back to his actual home. Now, as it turns out, Joe was known to not always be telling the complete truth. He would often drink and drive and locals stated that it was not an uncommon sight to see his car run off the side of the road. The local community didn't really like Joe for one reason or another. Some comments made about him were that he was quite spiteful and ungrateful. Apparently, one of his family members said that if Joe was ever the victim of foul play, you'd never be able to figure out who it was because everyone disliked him. As it later turned out during the police investigation, Joe didn't even own a cabin on that mountain, nor was he trying to book one to take his family to. But he had been seen drinking at a bar earlier, so the likely hypothesis was that he'd done his usual stunt of drinking and then driving and had come off the wrong road and ended up on the mountain while trying to get home. Given that seems to be the case, it's understandable then why he might have come up with that whole story in the first place. While the nice couple from earlier were driving Joe home, his story changed somewhat in the car too. During conversation, he told them that while he was driving up the mountain to check on this supposed cabin, 
Another driver was so close behind him the entire way that he couldn't stop or turn around. True to his reputation, he then complained about the man's driving skills, who was literally taking him home. And also, he didn't thank the couple once they'd reached his home. He just got out without saying a word and then entered his house. Anyway, that's enough about Joe for now. What on earth were the boys doing up there? As you can see, from Chico to Yuba City, it's a simple drive down the highway to get home. They could have turned onto Highway 99, or gone down 149 and then south down 70. But they didn't do either of these things. Oroville Quincy Road, on the other hand, where Jack's car was found, was 70 miles in the opposite direction of where they should have gone, and not to mention, literally up a mountain. So, how did these men come to be on this inhospitable mountain so far away from their homes, you ask? Nobody knows. None of the boys knew this road, and they had no business being there. Roughly eight years prior was the last time that Bill had gone fishing with his father at a cabin not too far away from this road. But Bill didn't enjoy himself and stayed at home with his mother the next time his father made the trip. Around three years prior to that, Ted went on a hunting trip with his friends in the Feather River country, but it was much further to the west of Oroville Quincy Road. None of the boys enjoyed the forest, nor camping with the exception of Gary, who occasionally stayed out all night with his friends. It is important to just highlight that each of these men, for the most part, led stay-at-home lives, and no one could figure out just what had taken them up that remote, lonely road. They quite literally, as said, had to drive 70 miles the wrong way, and then up an unpaved road, which they could not have mistaken with the way home. On this mountain, the boys were surrounded by the Plumas National Forest, which as mentioned, we know that practically all of them, except for Gary, would have hated being there. Now, in the morning at around 10am, while the parents were frantically calling one another and trying to figure out where their boys were, Bill Neal, a forest ranger, was driving up the very road where Joe had his episode, and of course, where the boy's car was. Bill parked next to Jack's car and made a couple of observations. First, he thought the car had gotten stuck, and perhaps the occupants had gotten out and then went to look for help. However, he quickly realised that the car actually wasn't stuck, or at least not to the degree that it couldn't be freed fairly easily. Around the wheels, the snow was around 6 inches deep, and there were skid marks present, indicating that the wheels had been spinning, and then they just couldn't get any further up. Bill thought that even one man pushing it would have gotten it out. Of course, in the car, there were five men, and despite their individual needs that they had, they were all athletic, fit, and strong. In this situation, and because of their needs, it might be easy to discount them, and say that perhaps they just didn't think to push it. But I don't really think that tells the whole story, because pushing the car free would certainly have crossed Gary's mind, likely Madruga's, and maybe Bill's. Let's also not forget that Jack Hewitt worked on a farm, and I'd imagine would have helped push things free from time to time. Though this was of course a novel experience, and there may have been some stress and panic involved, which can really hurt one's decision making abilities. The point being, is that Bill Neal felt that this vehicle could have become unstuck without a lot of effort. Upon inspection, he noted that the driver's side window was rolled down and the car was unlocked. This was unlike Jack, as this car was very much his prized possession, and would not usually have left it like this. Like Joe, Bill noticed the wrappers and empty bottles and such. The scene mostly looked like the boys had enjoyed a nice drive home, but somehow, for some reason, that is not clear at all, decided to drive up a mountain towards the snow line. Bill was attending a skiing trip that day, and as he went further up the road, he then found Joe's car, still stuck where it was left. Later that day, Joe Sean's wife came to retrieve the vehicle with the help of another man. But they couldn't quite finish the job, though they did manage to move it closer to Jack's car. When Bill was finished with his skiing, he came back down the mountain at around 2pm and noticed that Joe's car had been moved. Interestingly enough, he also felt that Jack's car had been moved too, but he wasn't completely sure though he did make a mental note of the fact that the window was still rolled down. At 6pm that day, Joe had been admitted to the Oroville Medical Centre, where it was confirmed that he was being treated for a mild heart attack that he'd sustained the night before. At 8pm, another call was made to police about the fact that the boys still had not returned. They'd missed their scheduled basketball game, and now the authorities were interested in what was happening, and began an official investigation. 
The information that Joe Shones and now Bill Neal possessed had not been shared with the police because nobody apart from the parents really knew that anything was wrong. February the 28th marked the day when the authorities themselves officially found Jack Madruga's car. As the investigation progressed, all of the details that we've spoken about thus far became apparent to the police. But now, at this time, the boys had been missing for three days and there were no clues surrounding the car to go on. It hadn't broken down, it wasn't badly stuck, it had plenty of petrol and there was nothing to indicate that something had gone badly wrong, even though something must have. The police hotwired the car and found that it started immediately without a problem. On the first day, plans had been drawn up and searchers gathered on Auroville Quincy Road near the car to fan out beyond the tree line to see if they could uncover anything. However, during the very first search, there was an ice storm and it was so severe that one member of the search party displayed signs of hypothermia and another almost had a heart attack. So the day one search was forced to end early. Once the storm had cleared, the searchers brought in a lot of resources to help find the boys. They had search dogs, helicopters, horses and ATVs. But the dense forests surrounding the road just had nothing to offer. All they had was the idea that for some reason that nobody could ascertain, the boys must have been compelled for some reason to head up that mountain. It's difficult to argue that they were up there accidentally, because as said, they'd gone in the total opposite direction away from their homes. I'd also imagine that it's fairly difficult to accidentally start driving up the side of a mountain. So, did they have private or secretive plans that they hadn't told anyone about? Given how committed they were to the basketball game the following day, I'm not so sure. The police, parents and everyone else were stumped, and as a result, the authorities offered a cash reward for information. Now, doing this is often a double-edged sword, because as is often the case, the police get inundated with false positive sightings that are just not helpful at all. However, one report came in that was considered significant. Rosella Mulder stated that on the 26th, which was the Sunday, two days after the boys had vanished on that Friday night, at 2.30pm, she'd packed up at Mary's Country Store in Brownsville, right next to a red pickup truck. Inside the truck, there were two men who were smiling or grinning at her. She said that she believed they had a mental handicap. A short distance away from the truck, two other men were using a phone booth. One was speaking, and the other, she said, was looking a little nervous, as if he was looking around. Inside the store itself, there was another man. The sighting was important, because when the police showed her a lineup of pictures, she picked all of the boys except for Gary. One flaw here might have been that she'd previously seen the boys' pictures on TV, and while you might think that could only be helpful in identifying people, it also increases the likelihood of confirmation bias. This act specifically though is known as unconscious transference, which is a memory error that occurs when an eyewitness to a crime misidentifies a familiar but innocent person from a police lineup. Of course, the boys were not suspected of committing a crime, but the principle of misidentification could certainly apply here. Relevant studies to police lineups have shown that you're more likely to identify those you've seen before, even if innocent, because you expect them to be involved based on prior exposure to their pictures. There are plenty of incidents where completely innocent people have been chosen out of a lineup for this very reason. However, Mr. Carol Waltz was on his shift working at the store, and he went through the same process with the police as Rosella. It's not clear if he'd previously seen their pictures, but out of a lineup, he picked out Ted and Jack Hewitt, perhaps adding further credibility that this may have been a true positive sighting but he didn't identify the other three. Furthermore, Joe Shearns was contacted while he was still in hospital at the beginning of March, and there he gave the police the outline of his story. But he also added something completely unhelpful, that while he was on the mountain trying to get help from the figures he could see walking around, he said that there were between two and 12 of them. That's quite the range. With estimating skills like that, you might as well not have them. Although, despite earlier talking about a red pickup truck that was also present, during the conversation with the police, he said that he might have hallucinated the truck and wasn't sure if it was there or not. I suppose, to be fair, he was having a heart attack at the time and it was very cold. I'd imagine his body must have been under a lot of stress. So perhaps he had been hallucinating and things were hazy while he was recovering. 
About a week later, on the 7th, he did tell the police that he'd changed his mind and that he was certain that he'd seen a red pickup truck that night. Mention of a red pickup truck would come once more. Another testimony that the police took seriously was by a man named Mr. Redrick, who owned a property in Plumas National Park. He relayed that roughly one year before the date of disappearance, he'd seen Ted Wire around this area in the middle of the woods not far from his cabin. Ted wasn't alone. He was with a man that Mr. Redrick thought was between 40 and 50 years old, as well as a younger lad of around 16. Mr. Redrick recalled that it seemed like they were out hunting. Only, Ted was said to be scared of the dark and didn't really like hunting as he didn't want to hurt animals. His testimony ended with him saying that he'd seen the three of them drive away together in a red pickup truck. Interesting. Did Ted have contact in this area with someone that no one else knew about? Is that why they were up there? Did they receive an invitation or something? That's really not clear, but whatever happened to these men was nothing short of disturbing. Months after the disappearance of the boys took place, June 4th, 1978 would mark an important date. By this time, the snow had begun to recede, which was a major problem throughout the duration of the search. There was just so much snow present that it was difficult to navigate the area. Five air miles to the north of Madruga's car, or about 20 miles on foot, there are a number of park service trailers. These trailers are run by the National Park Service, responsible for looking after the Plumas National Park, and were just one such site of many. These trailers are completely furnished and are stocked with food, water, and heating supplies that could keep someone alive for over a year. One issue with this trailer site is that it spends a lot of time surrounded by layers of snow and is practically buried for much of the year. Well, on the 4th, a group of motorcyclists were riding through backcountry roads where they found this trailer camp and they noticed that one of the trailers had a shattered window. They also noticed that as they approached, an awful smell was emanating from inside. The group got closer to the window and noticed that empty food cans were strewn on the ground. As they got right up against the window, they quickly realised that there was a body laying in one of the beds, covered in sheets as if someone had made a desperate attempt to stay warm from the freezing cold. A short distance away, in a north-easterly direction from the trailer, there was a bed sheet and a single abandoned sock in the snow. This group then obviously alerted police to their find. Local deputies arrived on scene at the campsite soon after receiving the call. The scene was approached cautiously given the unusual circumstances. Upon entering the trailer, investigators found a grim scene. Beside one of the bedroom doors, there was a pair of tennis shoes. An inspection of the body revealed that it was in an advanced state of decomposition, and it appeared that the individual had passed away several weeks prior to being found. The body had suffered from severe frostbite, which was apparent on the hands and feet. Nearby, personal items such as a wallet and some photographs were found, which helped to identify that the person they were looking at was none other than Ted Wire. The condition of the trailer suggested that it looked like it survived for some time after the group was reported missing. Again, there were signs that food supplies had been used, reportedly somewhere around 30 to 70 cans of food had been used. A makeshift calendar on the wall suggested a count of days. This pointed to the likelihood that Ted, and, or perhaps another member of the group, had been alive for a significant period in the trailer, possibly hoping for rescue or unable to leave due to physical or psychological barriers. Another indicator that Ted had been there for quite some time was the fact that when he went missing in the first place, he was clean shaven, but now, inside the trailer, it was found that he had a full beard. He may have been alive in there for over two months. The reason the police began to suspect that Ted might not have been alone in the trailer was because firstly, the tennis shoes were identified as belonging to Gary Mathias, not Ted. Secondly, the way that Ted's body was wrapped inside the blankets suggested that someone might have assisted him in there. Ted's arms were right up against his body and it appeared as though a secondary person had wrapped him tightly inside to stay warm. Ted's cause of passing was put down as a result of pulmonary edema, which likely came about due to pneumonia that got particularly severe. It appeared as though the real cause of this infection was the injuries and frostbite sustained while out in the snow. 
Somehow, the group had obviously found themselves in bad trouble here. Perhaps Gary assisted a heavily struggling Ted into the trailer. Gary's tennis shoes were found inside and Ted's brown boots were missing. Perhaps Gary put on the thicker boots to try to reach the others or find help. The whole scene and circumstances just stinks of panic because right next to the trailer are two sheds with a lot of food and heating supplies. While clearly the building with the food supplies had been entered, there was no evidence present to suggest that they'd ever attempted to start a fire. It's just not really clear why that might have been the case. Could it be that they were hiding from someone or didn't want to alert their presence to someone? It surely can't have been that they just didn't think to do it, since it appears that Gary was present. Gary was in the army and enjoyed camping, so he would most certainly have known how to get a fire going. And he would have known just how important it was in this instance. What possible reason could he have had for not doing just that? It's something that doesn't have a great explanation. There is evidence that a candle was lit. Was this an effort for warmth while also remaining under the radar or trying to keep their presence quiet? I'm speculating of course, but that is a very odd situation. In the building with the heating supplies, they'd have had everything they needed to stay warm. There were oil heaters and oil supplies, there was gasoline, and there was even a large butane tank that fed directly into the trailer. Though the tank may not have been visible to the boys because of the snow. To clarify, it does appear that the shed with the heating equipment had been broken into, but the items just weren't used for some reason. I must admit, this is a case I've looked at a number of times throughout the years, and I still think that there was an element of them hiding and not wanting to be noticed. Though that does not at all explain why they wouldn't have used the oil heaters. In any case, based on the evidence present, authorities determined that only Gary and Ted had been present in the trailer. So Madruga, Hewitt and Bill, for some reason, had been separated from the group. Was this as a result of some kind of panic? Could they have been trying to get away from someone and in a mad dash, separated into two groups? In the same north-easterly direction, past the sock and bedsheet found in the snow, Investigators found four blankets and a flashlight. Could this have been an attempt made by Gary to get help? Further searches of the surrounding area led to more unsettling discoveries. On the 6th of June, the bodies of Jack Madruga and Bill Sterling were discovered by search dogs almost seven miles to the south of the trailer. On the 8th, Jack Hewitt's body was found around two miles away to the southeast of the trailer. Each of the bodies had been badly damaged due to animal predation. The authorities had now found four out of the five members of the group, and now the search was on for Gary Matthias. But despite pouring a lot of resources into this, they could never locate his body. Even to this day, Gary's final whereabouts are not known. Did he manage to find safety or rescue? It seems unlikely, as he was never heard from again. Madruga, Sterling and Hewitt were all said to have passed away as a result of hypothermia and exposure. And of course, they would have passed away much, much sooner than Ted did. Likely on the very first night while travelling away from the car. Ted, and likely Gary, had travelled just shy of 20 miles on foot from the car to this trailer. It would have been absolutely freezing, pitch black, and they would have been wading through deep snow. Jack Madruga and Bill must have walked around 13 miles, while Jack Hewitt made it around 18 miles from the car. In the conditions that they found themselves in, that is nothing short of bizarre. They took on such a tremendous task, instead of just pushing the car out of the snow. To reach the safety of the trailer, the boys had gone down the worst possible route as well. It was the longest route they could have possibly taken. This is what that must have looked like. As we know from the parents, Jack Madruga and Bill Sterling were best friends and basically inseparable at the hip. So it makes sense that they would have passed away together first, if neither wanted to leave the other behind. This would have left Jack Hewitt, Ted and Gary who went on before Jack also fell, leaving Gary and Ted to make their way to the trailer. This begs the question, did they even know about the trailer or did they find it by accident? It certainly seems that to some extent, that even though they'd taken the longest route, they still may have been heading towards it. Interestingly, there was a snow-capped vehicle that had earlier cleared a path through the snow. So I suppose that was probably how they found it in the end, just by following the already made path. We're at that point now where it's speculation time, so just bear that in mind as we move forwards. If someone did know the location of the trailer, 
I can't imagine that it was anyone but Gary. Perhaps Ted, as he had been hunting at least once, though it wasn't in this exact area. Though if Mr. Redrick was correct about seeing Ted hunting in these parts with an older man and his son, then he may have known about it. That's not something that's known, but I only bring this up because one popular hypothesis out there is that Gary, for some reason, had either planned this entire ordeal, or he snapped while they were out for some reason. There's no hard evidence for this of course, and it remains in the realm of speculation. This is mostly because, according to Gary's doctor, he was doing well, he was taking his medication, and he didn't miss any appointments. From that perspective, medical professionals seem to think that he was handling his schizophrenia well, and he'd come a long way from the days that he was in the army. The doctor also stated that he felt that Gary could have gone for about a month without his medication before his behaviour would have significantly shifted. I suppose it's also important that we remember that the coach did say that his aggressive outbursts hadn't exactly gone away completely. The coach said that Gary on occasion could flip out. Though I'd imagine Gary was involved in sports while this would occur, so I'm wondering if that heightened level of adrenaline or stress could cause problems for his schizophrenia. Those close to Gary did state though that while at the Gateway Projects, he'd become very social and personable. He was taking care of himself, doing volunteer work, and those working at the Gateway Projects themselves said that he was very much becoming a great example of what can be achieved with the right care and support. They said that he and the boys became very close during this time, and as said earlier, Gary became very protective over the rest of the group. The point being that if Gary had snapped or was struggling with episodes, it would likely have been visible by those close to him, including his family and medical professionals. So based on that information, it's hard to imagine that he snapped, and I'm not convinced that it was some kind of plot by him to get rid of the others. Based on all the available information, he seemed to care an awful lot about them. Not only that, but it looks like he'd helped Ted to the trailer, and probably spent quite some time there with him. I think you can reason that, because upon inspection of Ted's body, it was stated that it appeared that someone had helped him wrap up in the sheets. The only other person who looks to have made it to the trailer was Gary, and since it appears that Ted had spent perhaps two months in there, it seems that perhaps Gary had wrapped him up before leaving himself, meaning he also may have been in there for about the same time. It could have been that Gary realised that he was losing Ted, and understood that he either found help right there and then, or it was bust, and they were both going to perish to the elements like the others. Now with that being said, I don't have a great explanation for why the oil heaters wouldn't have been used. Perhaps they just overlooked them, or perhaps they couldn't identify what they were? I'm really not sure about that, that just seems so strange if they were there for a period of two months. Though I am sure that there would have been some serious mental degradation over time, to the point that nothing was clear at all. Ted for example, went from weighing around 200 pounds on the night of his disappearance, to closer to 100 when his body was found. So it's very likely that their physical health and mental health deteriorated significantly over those two months. The sheriff's office, among practically all of the other outlets at the time, had reported that whoever remained inside the trailer had made no effort to make a fire. This insinuates, especially from the sheriff's report, that they had the means to do so. Otherwise, I'm not sure why it would have been stated. I can only imagine there must have been some dry wood present. Gary smoked, had matches and a lighter, so why not use them? As I said earlier, throughout the years, I've always felt that the boys were fleeing, and didn't want the pursuer to locate them. I don't know how that translates into not making a fire for two months after they had successfully got away from this hypothetical pursuer though. The point I'm really making is that it seems to me that Gary was just as much a victim as everyone else here. The evidence seems to suggest that he was looking after Ted as best he could. Thinking back to Jack's car, when Joe found it, he stated that the window was rolled down. Except, we know that it was absolutely freezing that night, so for what reason might Jack have had to roll the window down? Did someone come up to their car on the mountain where there was some kind of confrontation or threat? Was it the driver of this red pickup truck that was brought up and spotted in various witness testimonies? Or could it have been that Joe himself had confronted the boys for whatever reason and then made up the story about the pickup truck? The possibility that Joe himself might be more directly involved than previously thought adds another layer of complexity that ought to be considered. 
His own inconsistencies, such as his claims of seeing this red truck, which he later described in varying states of certainty, one moment this ranged from a hallucination, and then to a more vivid sighting when he later changed his mind, it most certainly raises significant doubts about his reliability, that let's be honest, already seem questionable anyway. His shifting accounts could be indicative of someone trying to mislead the investigator, or to cover their own tracks. Moreover, the changes in his story about why he was on the mountain that night, from visiting his non-existent cabin, to making sure that the roads were safe for his family, suggests quite strongly that he wasn't very forthcoming about his intentions. I get the impression that the authorities almost certainly felt that he was hiding something, but there was no evidence present that he'd harmed anyone. If Joe did have an encounter with the boys, the rolled down window in the freezing weather could suggest a rushed, perhaps even forced interaction, possibly instigated by Joe himself. This interaction could have escalated into a confrontation, potentially explaining why the boys might have felt compelled to flee into the harsh wilderness without preparing for it at all. They were not wearing appropriate clothing for such an endeavour, but does it really make sense that the five men would have run away from Joe? It doesn't seem like it, unless, and to clarify I'm speculating, could Joe have been carrying, scared the boys away, and then later discarded it or just put it away at home? No one would be any the wiser if that had happened. The fact that the existence of the red pickup truck is perhaps somewhat dubious also doesn't help Joe very much. If you remember, Two days after the disappearance, the supposed truck was seen in connection with the boys at Mary's Country Store in Brownsville. If we just stop to consider what this means for a moment, I think it becomes less legitimate. It implies that the boys left the mountain with the help of whoever owned the red truck, travelled to Brownsville, never went home, never called their parents or anyone else, and then missed their basketball game. It's not clear where they would have stayed or what they were doing. Then, at some point on the 26th or the 27th, they walked back up the mountain or were taken back up by the owners of the truck with the intention of freeing the car. Then something went wrong and they fled into the cold, dark, harsh, inhospitable mountain. It seems more likely to me that something happened on the night of the 24th as opposed to that. To further cast doubt on that, Rosella Mulder, as mentioned earlier, stated that she'd seen Jack Hewitt using the phone booth. This goes against all Jack's behavioural patterns as he had a major speech impediment and preferred not to speak, so it seems that he'd be the least likely to have been using the phone. Removing the Brownsville sighting from consideration leaves the two other sightings of the red truck, one involving Ted seen leaving with the unidentified man who looked to be with his son, and then Joe's mention of the truck, Joe's account potentially being rather dubious for reasons we've already been through. So it very much could be that there was no pickup truck. Joe could have mentioned that to the police in the first place to get his own name in the clear, since his car was stuck fairly close to Jack's and likely thought that he was a primary suspect. So we've mentioned the possibility of something like foul play, as in someone may have scared the boys, but it's particularly difficult to understand why they might have gone up the mountain in the first place. Many people believe that the boys might have seen something that they shouldn't have, or had some other kind of altercation while at or coming out of the basketball game they'd attended? Could this have led to them being followed away from the game and not wanting to show their pursuers where they lived, so they purposefully drove the wrong way to get away from them? Perhaps they had the intention of losing them in Oroville and afterwards wanted to circle back towards Yuba City. Perhaps they failed, accidentally turned onto the mountain and were then followed up the mountain by this second group. Maybe that's what this red truck was and then they fled into the forest where everything else transpired. But even that falls flat on its face because after the game they went to buy snacks. Perhaps then, it was after exiting that store that they'd seen something that they shouldn't or they had an altercation with someone or a group. You'd think that Mary, the store clerk at the time, would have noticed something and the police would most certainly have heard about that. In fact, a special agent from the California Department of Justice, John Thompson, was quoted as saying that this incident was bizarre as hell without a single explanation. Jack Madruga's mother seemed to be on the same page as I am in some sense because she stated, and I quote, that there was some force that made them go up there. They wouldn't have fled off into the woods like a bunch of quail. We know good and well that somebody made them do it. We can't visualize someone getting the upper hand on those five men but we know it must have been. Ted's sister speculated and stated, they must have seen something at that game, at the parking lot, 
they might have seen it and didn't even realise they'd seen it. Gary's stepfather added that he simply couldn't understand why Gary must have been as scared as he was. He added, they didn't even build a fire. They had all of those paperbacks and didn't even build a lousy fire. I can't understand why they didn't do that unless they were afraid. But therein lies the whole crux of this incident. Nobody knew what they were afraid of, including the investigators. There was no evidence to suggest foul play, and yet the whole incident feels unexplainable without it. All I really know is that going so far away from their homes was so out of character for them that something has to have pushed them up there. Just travelling deeper and deeper into total darkness and the unknown does not make sense. In the end, I truly think that something absolutely terrified them. I don't know what it was, and each hypothesis is riddled with flaws. But I think they desperately tried to reach shelter. Only Gary and Ted made it, and then they wanted to hide, quite desperately from whatever they were fleeing from. I must say though, this case has always left me scratching my head. There doesn't seem to be a unifying hypothesis that answers all of the questions sufficiently without creating new problems. What exactly took place on that mountain? I was about to end it there, but, and I'm editing this in awkwardly after the fact, as I might have a more unifying hypothesis. I went away and thought about this for a while, and I went through some of my old psychology books and read some journals online to learn more about schizophrenia. I didn't find anything too helpful initially, but then I came across a concept known as shared madness, or rather, something that is known as shared psychotic disorder. Firstly, it's important to note that this is extremely rare to occur in groups of more than two people, but it might just fit this case. Let's get a brief understanding of what this is. Shared psychotic disorder is a rare disorder characterized by sharing a specific delusion among two or more people in a close relationship. The inducer who has a psychotic disorder with delusions influences another individual or more based on a delusional belief. It is commonly seen among two individuals, but in rare cases can include larger groups. This disorder used to be thought of in isolation, but since the DSM-5, released in 2013, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders Handbook, used by healthcare professionals, this disorder is now included within the schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders. A completely hypothetical example of this taking place would be to imagine two brothers that are living in isolation away from others. One of the siblings develops a delusion that they're being targeted by some kind of secretive organisation or group. Perhaps they feel that they're being watched, stalked, and feeling like they're in danger. The other sibling, through close association and influence of his brother, might also begin to believe in these delusional ideas, despite having no evidence of it whatsoever, and having no prior psychiatric problems. This shared madness might lead both of the siblings to take irrational and dangerous actions based on their delusions such as, perhaps, running away into a dark and cold forest to get away from their perceived threat. So, let's briefly apply this hypothetical explanation to the boys' situation, which is quite easy at this stage because we've already been through all of the key incidents. It's now just thinking about them in a different light. So, could it be possible that while driving home from Mary's store on East 8th and Pine, that likely Gary or perhaps another member of the group, maybe Jack Madruga, started to believe that they were being followed, as opposed to physically being followed as we earlier went through. This idea of being followed could even have sprung up on the highway instead of the store. All of these men were vulnerable in some way. The parents described all of them as such, and that pretty much all of them were easily led. Meaning, I can't imagine it would be too difficult to have the boys fall victim to believing a lie or a delusion. If Jack Madruga, while driving, started to believe that they were being followed or were in danger, this, again, hypothetical delusion could have triggered Gary and then the others were engulfed by it. Similarly, it could have been Gary himself that started to believe this and then this episode of shared psychotic disorder began and spread to the others. Remember, John Thompson, among others, expressed their sheer incredulity at this case, saying how it doesn't really make sense without invoking some kind of foul play or threat. Yet, there was no evidence of this at all. Could the threat have been entirely imagined by one and then everyone? 
If they were having a fight or flight response and were now in hide mode, it would make sense that Gary wouldn't want to make a fire because that would mean creating a beacon that would highlight their position. I'm sure that there are other explanations to consider, but this is one explanation that doesn't need to invoke ideas of foul play, which there wasn't really any evidence for. I'll leave you with that thought. I'd just like to take the time to thank you for watching, and a big thank you to the patrons who've been running around on the screen. Please do remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and do drop me a comment as I read pretty much all of them. I hope that you've had a great day or evening, depending on where you are, and I'll see you in the next one. Be safe guys. Peace.